What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Really fun show lined up for you today. I want to go over some of the depth chart updates, if you will, following Packers mini camps and OTAs up until this point. I do think there is only a little bit sometimes that we can glean from some of these different roster battles. And I think we just have to remember back to Ben Braden a season ago, who at this point in time through OTAs and mini camps was getting a ton of buzz, even from the Packers offensive line coaches. He was practicing with the ones out of nowhere and everyone, you know, myself included was talking about, could Ben Braden end up being a starter in 2021? And then at the end of training camp, he didn't even make the roster. He didn't get claimed by anyone, ends up on the practice squad for the vast majority of the year. So we do have to handle this with a little bit of care. But when it does come to mini camps and OTAs, of course, everyone's practicing in shorts. A lot of this stuff is at, you know, half speed or 75% speed. You'll get a couple two minute drills that are a little bit more competitive and things like that. But there is only so much that you can take away. But I do think one of the more fun things to discuss and sort of disseminate is exactly who's lined up where and what is sort of the potential depth chart look like. So that is what I want to get into today. I want to preface it again by saying, you know, there's some things that we need to take with a grain of salt, but I'll kind of go over that as we kind of go through these. And what I'm kind of going to do is let you know if I'm sort of buying or selling that I actually believe where the players are at from a depth chart standpoint. So at quarterback and running back, there's really nothing noteworthy here. Of course, Rogers is the one, Love is the two, Bankert's the three, etc. At running back, Jones is the one, Dylan's the two. And then after that, it's sort of everyone is sort of competing for the same spot. Wide receiver is the first one where I think we've started to see some of these tiers sort of develop. So you know, Alan Lazard was not at many camps or OTAs, but it's very clear he will be one of the first tier wide receivers on this team. Sammy Watkins was in that tier. Randall Cobb was in that tier. And then uh, Watt, Christian Watson as well was in that tier. They were all practicing primarily with the ones through the vast majority of OTAs and mini camps so far. So that is sort of your first tier. Your second tier, I would say, is Amari Rogers, Romeo Dobbs, and Juwan Winfrey, who have all sort of split reps with the ones and the twos. I would probably give a slight advantage here to Amari and Dobbs over Winfrey, but all three of them have practiced with the ones in some capacity. So I would say that is your second tier at this point. Your third tier, I would say, would be Samari Toure and Malik Taylor, who have practiced with the twos. Uh, in sort of the in the second group primarily, and I would give Toure a bit of a um, advantage in that battle as well. And then the final tier would just be Danny Davis, who has been all with the twos, and you can just tell he's sort of a tier behind everyone else at this point. And I buy all of this so far. Um, the one thing I would note here, and I think that you know, maybe isn't super shocking, but is at least maybe a little bit of a development is I do think Malik Taylor is going to have a very difficult time breaking this wide receiver roster. It just seems to me that when you start doing, and again, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but the wide receiver, Matt, it just seems Lazard, Watkins, Cobb, and Watson are locks. I think Amari and Dobbs are clearly locks. And then I think there's a seventh wide receiver spot potentially there between Juwan Winfrey, Malik Taylor, and Samori Toure. And it just seems to me that Toure and Winfrey are the better overall wide receivers. And Toure and Winfrey are also getting better as special teams players as well. And it's just getting harder and harder for, for Malik Taylor to differentiate himself as a potential roster player player. So listen, it is a great thing if your ninth best wide receiver is Malik Taylor. I think they have, you know, the potential to have nine legitimate 53-man roster wide receivers. Now, a lot of those are what I would consider maybe number three through number six wide receivers on most rosters. But either way, it's nice to have nine guys who you feel okay with being on a 53-man roster at wide receiver. Um, That being said, I think it's going to be very difficult for Malik Taylor to make this team. But again, Lazard, Watkins, Cobb, and Watson on your first tier, Amari Dobbs, Winfrey on that second tier, Taylor and Toure on the third tier, and then Danny Davis on the fourth tier. That's how wide receivers sort of shaken out so far. And again, I'm I'm buying that so far as to where people stand. Although uh, I do think Toure could eventually move up. Winfrey needs to stay healthy. We'll get into more of that as training camp breaks, but that's where I'm placing everything at this point. At tight end, to me, th- there are clear tiers here as well. That number one tight end, and what I consider a number one tight end is sort of your overall tight end. They can block a little bit. They can receive a little bit. Like you put them out there and it's not a tell to the opposing team of what you're doing, right? 
to me, Robert Tunyon, even though he hasn't practiced so far, is your clear number one tight end. And then, you know, Davis, to me, Tyler Davis is the next guy up on that list. And he, to me, would be the number one. Now, he would potentially, in my opinion, get less playing time than maybe a Robert Tunyon would. And they'd probably use Mercedes a little bit more, use DeGuar a little bit more, and, you know, kind of mix and match some of the different positions, maybe go less tight ends, maybe do some three wides with two running backs sort of stuff. So I think they might change the percentage of plays that you see that number one tight end. But to me, the next clear guy up after Robert Tunyon is Tyler Davis at this point. Your clear blocking tight end is Mercedes Lewis. And then you have the H-back depth chart, which is Josiah DeGuar at the one. And then the backup there would be Dominique Daphne. And I'm not sure any other tight end on the roster has differentiated themselves enough yet to even be in the conversation for any of those spots. So that is how I would label them right now. Along the offensive line, Clearly, David Bakhtiari is going to be the left tackle if he's healthy. But then after that, Yash Nyman seems to be the clear front runner at left tackle. We've seen Cole Van Landen get some snaps there as well. But to me, Yash is the left tackle if Bakhtiari is out, assuming Elton Jenkins is also out um, at some point. Left guard center are good. Right guard seems to be between Newman and Hansen at this point. And right tackle seems to be between Cole Van Landen, Royce Newman, and then Yash Nijman if In fact, David Bakhtiari is back at left tackle. Once again, if Jenkins, if and when Jenkins gets healthy, he would be in that conversation as well. But those seem to be the tiers right now. I do not buy this quite as much. A part of it is due to Ben Braden a season ago that we just discussed. But I also think A, Sean Ryan is going to get himself in this conversation at some point. And then B, I'm just not buying Cole Van Landen quite yet. I think this is more of a, hey, we're going to give the established player who's been here a little bit longer first dibs at this, but eventually we're going to open up competition. And I just find it hard to believe personally that Cole Van Landen could be in that conversation for a starting spot. I hope I'm wrong. I hope he's really, you know, really taking a major step and is in that conversation. That would be great. It would just be more depth for Green Bay. I'm just not buying it yet. So I do think Yash is the first backup at left tackle. I think left guard and center are decided. I think Royce Newman for now is the, you know, potential. I think he gets one of those spots, And then I think Sean Ryan and Jake Hansen would be the other ones that are in play there for one of the other starting spots. But once again, we're going to have to see how Elton Jenkins and Bakhtiari and some of those players progress and Yash could get in that right tackle discussion as well, but not quite buying the Cole Van Lannan potential starter quite yet. Everything else I think is, is pretty much the way that I would have expected it to be. On the defensive line, I think the big development here is that TJ Slayton seems to clearly be the number one nose tackle at this point. And that I do not think is fake. I think that's very legitimate. I think he is going to be the the key nose tackle in the 3-4. They're not going to play a ton of 3-4, right? But I think when they need 3-4 base defense, I guess base is really nickel nowadays, but if they need 3-4 defense or they need a goal line defense, a run stuff, a fourth and one, third and inches, things like that, it does seem to me that TJ Slayton is going to be the first option as the true nose tackle for Green Bay and very much buying that. And then I think those other spots, we haven't seen Lowry yet, but I think the other spots, clearly Kenny Clark, Dean Lowry, Jerron Reed, you know, I, I think those sort of players, Devontae Wyatt, are going to be more in a rotation with Kenny Clark getting the majority of those reps at the other defensive line spots. But TJ Slayton seems to be very much the leader in the clubhouse for that nose tackle spot, and I am very much buying that up until this point. Edge is a little bit murky because Randy Ramsey hasn't been out there yet, and I do very much believe he is going to be in the conversation for that number three edge rusher position. But as of right now, Ladarius Hamilton and Tipa Naliai have been practicing ahead of Jonathan Garvin and Kingsley and Igbari. And right now, I am very much buying that. I very much am intrigued by Ladarius Hamilton. Tipa has a little bit more experience and was much better on tape a season ago than Jonathan Garvin was. I do think Kingsley and Igbari is just going to need some time to bulk up and be a potential difference maker down the road for Green Bay. I love that pick. I think he has a ton of upside just think it may take him a year or two to really kind of grow into himself. So I'm not putting a ton of stock into, you know, Kingsley and Igbari as the number three edge rusher at this point. So I am buying right now Ladarius Hamilton and Tipa as the three and four ahead of Garvin and Kingsley. Now, I do think Kingsley and Igbari is going to make the team. And I do think he has the ability to get in that conversation along with Randy Ramsey when he comes back as well. But I am buying Hamilton and Tipa ahead of Garvin and Kingsley at this point. And we'll have to see 
how things maybe shake out a little bit different come training camp and when maybe they give Kingsley another, you know, or an opportunity at that spot and when, you know, hopefully Randy Ramsey comes back as well. Inside linebacker, Chris Barnes and Quay Walker are sort of splitting reps. It very, very, very much seems like they want to give that to Quay. They want to sort of be respectful to Chris Barnes. I do think Chris Barnes is going to have some sort of role in this defense. I do think he may have some package that he's involved in, whether that's just a three off-ball linebacker role, maybe in more of a 4-3 look or a goal line look, whether that's more of like a base defense where maybe they don't overwhelm Quay quite as much early on with more of the base defense responsibilities and maybe keep him in nickel uh, and, and have him primarily be responsible for that. I think those are all options, but I do think Barnes has potentially some role within this defense. But Quay and you know Quay ultimately, I think is going to be the two. Barnes is going to be the three. But as I mentioned yesterday, Ray Wilborn practiced with the ones and seems to be making a push for that number four spot. As stated yesterday, that could just be logistics and wanting to get Summers and McDuffie more time, knowing that if they put them down with the twos, they would actually get more snaps than being the fourth guy with the ones. So those are sort of just the things that we don't know logistically of what Green Bay is trying to accomplish. But I am slightly buying here Ray Wilborn as a, a real legitimate, you know, potential inside linebacker number four. I think there's a lot to shake out there. I think McDuffie and Summers and that entire group you know, has the opportunity to get in that conversation. I would just say don't rule out Ray Wilborn as a real option as a potential roster player here. And just the fact that he did get reps with some of the number one defense to me is a little bit telling. So I'm not all in on Ray Wilborn and I'm not saying he's going to be linebacker four yet, but I do think he is very much in that conversation and I'm not so sure that he isn't linebacker four right now. So that will be another really interesting one to keep an eye on come training camp time. At corner, it is very, very clear to me that Kayshawn Nixon is corner four and I will go so far as to say I will be shocked barring injuries and stuff like that if Kayshawn Nixon isn't corner four come start of the season. Clearly, Jair, Stokes, Douglas as your first three, and then in, in whatever capacity. And then to me, Kayshawn's a four. And then everything else after that, at the, that corner five and corner six, are completely up for grabs and should be really fun to keep an eye on. The other thing I will say here is I do believe that Rico Gafford has a real legitimate chance to make this team. This is not, to me, just some interesting, weird reclamation project, moving a guy from wide receiver to corner. I think he has a real chance at corner, but more importantly, he's been very involved as a jammer, or excuse me, a gunner on special teams. He has been in some of the return duties. I just think he probably has more value as a potential returner, special teams guy, emergency wide receiver, corner number five or six, he would just potentially have so much more value than maybe some of these other wide receiver or excuse me, other back of the end cornerbacks. So keep an eye on Rico Gafford as well. I think he has a real chance, but the biggest takeaway here from many camps and OTA so far is Kayshawn Nixon clearly to me is going to be corner four unless something crazy happens where another corner just steps up in a massive way and takes that job from him. And then at safety, and this has been much talked about already, but Sean Davis seems to have a real edge so far at safety uh, number three behind Amos, behind Savage, and I am very much buying this. Davis is a really interesting story. He was a fifth round pick just last year with the Colts. Like they spent a legit, like that's not nothing, right? That's Kingsley and Igbari. So like the Indianapolis Colts cut him after training camp. That would be the equivalent of the Packers cutting Kingsley and Igbari at the end of training camp, putting him not getting claimed them putting him on their practice squad and then quickly cutting him from their practice squad. That's what happened with Sean Davis a season ago. And Green Bay quickly moved him to the practice squad once the Colts moved on from him. And then in December, moved him to the active roster and he made his active roster debut against the Browns on Christmas. And at that time, moved ahead of Vernon Scott and was the fourth safety on the team behind Amos Savage, Henry Black, uh, and then it was Sean Davis. So he quickly moved up the ladder in Green Bay. You know, if you remember, he he didn't test in the agility drills and, and some of those sort of things. I don't think he did the speed drills either at the combine, but did the vertical and broad jump and was like an 89th percentile athlete in both of those. He's a little bit undersized, but I was watching the DB drills and he really stood out to me as a very explosive player. I'm very intrigued by Sean Davis. I can't point to a play in OTAs or minicamps of like, oh yeah, Sean Davis made this great play. 
but very intrigued. And he seems to have a leg up on that number three safety role. I'm very much buying that so far. And he will be absolutely a player to keep an eye on come training camp time. Kicker competition, I don't think is real. I think that's going to be Mason Crosby by far, by far, by far in a way. I don't think uh, Eberly is a real competition there. Long snapper does seem to be a legit competition. I think Coco has the opportunity to compete with Wordle. And I mean, we're just going to talk about Coco and Wordle all off season because why wouldn't you? What a great name battle to have at long snapper. But I do think that is a very legit competition, unlike kicker, where to me, if you know, once hopefully Crosby gets back healthy, I think he's going to run away with that competition against Eberly. That does it for me today. Hope you enjoyed this roster battle update following OTAs and mini camps. Think some of these are going to be really interesting come training camp. We'll see if some of these are for real, some are not. The one, the only one I'm really not buying at this point is, is Cole Van Landen. Like I said, I hope I'm wrong on that. I hope he's made a big jump and is in that conversation. Would just be more depth for Green Bay. That does it for me today. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.